Hello and welcome to this video on supercontinuum generation in nonlinear fiber optics. On the screen here, we see both the temporal and spectral evolutions of a high power pulse launched into a nonlinear fiber simulated in the paper mentioned right here, which is also linked in the description. Now, I've been working on my own implementation of the split step Fourier method for solving the generalized nonlinear Schrodinger equation and to benchmark my own code. I've decided to recreate the graph shown in that paper here. So if I overlay my own results on top, you can see that there's a pretty good match between the two. But one thing is to be able to simulate the evolution of a supercontinuum from a very narrow pulse here to one that's spectrally much broader. And a different thing is to actually understand which nonlinear mechanisms play in and cause this behavior to arise. Is it mainly the Raman effect or maybe mainly forward mixing or self steeping that causes this sort of behavior right here? So. Today, we're going to put on our detective hats and see if we can answer that question. First of all, here are the parameters of the pulse that we're launching into the medium. It's a hyperbolic secant pulse with a characteristic duration of around 160 femtoseconds and a peak power of 50 watts. So these two parameters by themselves should definitely be enough for all of the major nonlinear effects to be present, both the uh, Raman self steepening and some of the more basic ones. The carrier frequency is around uh, 283 terahertz, corresponding to 1060 nanometers, and the time resolution of this simulation is 1.8 femtoseconds. Recall that the Raman effect, which I've explained up here, takes place on a scale of tens of femtoseconds, so this should definitely be short enough to capture that accurately. Also, the number of points on the time axis is going to be 2 to the power of 14, like so. Now, the medium that we're launching this pulse through is a fiber with a length of 5 meters and a fairly high gamma parameter of almost 0.1 per watt per meter. And this number is quite large compared to, for example, what you have for a silica fiber. And I think essentially what they're simulating here is a photonic crystal fiber, which is characterized by a very, very narrow core and therefore a very high gamma parameter. Note also that the attenuation coefficient alpha is set to zero. So in some sense, the result of this simulation will be a best case scenario for how broad we can make the spectrum since if alpha um, were negative, meaning that we lose power as we move forward, the nonlinear effects would simply uh, turn off after a certain distance. So we're just ignoring that, uh, both in the paper, but also in the simulations I'm going to show you. Anyway, these uh, five meters of fiber are split into around a thousand steps in the set direction. So the smaller the steps, the more accurate the simulation, and it should hopefully avoid any uh, numerical errors. Both the Raman effect and self-steepening are turned on, and the beta 2 parameter right here is negative. That's quite important because it tells us that the pulse will initially experience um, a normal dispersion where blue light moves faster than red light. And this also has implications for phase matching, as we'll see in just a moment. We also include the higher order dispersion terms right here, and these will become more and more important the broader the spectrum of the pulse becomes. Finally, note that the zero dispersion frequency is just above the carrier frequency right here. So before we get into the actual simulations, I think it's helpful to review the different nonlinear effects that arise from the chi 3 nonlinearity and understand what impact they might have on the spectrum of the pulse. So first of all, uh, we can split the impact up into an instantaneous response due to the electrons moving around when a strong field is applied and a delayed response thanks to uh, vibrations in the molecular lattice being caused by the application of a very strong field. And essentially this molecular vibration is what we refer to as the Raman effect. If you look at the instantaneous contribution, if it depends on the gradient of the power in the field, then we get what's called self-steepening. And if you look at the terms that depend on the power in the field directly, then we get self-phase modulation, cross-phase modulation, or possibly four-wave mixing. So let's take a look at what each of these effects will do to the spectra. For self-phase modulation, if you launch a symmetric pulse into the medium, then you expect symmetric broadening in the spectral domain. Note that the broadening happens in terms of these uh, individual dopes instead of being completely uh, smooth, um, but generally it will be symmetrical as long as the input is symmetric as well. For cross-phase modulation, the, comp the complexity is a little bit higher because we have two different frequencies present, and if they overlap in the time domain inside of the nonlinear medium, then we can get uh, broadening in the spectral domain as well. And the exact way that this broadening happens depends a little on the exact way that they overlap in their pulse shapes, but in any case, we generally expect broadening from cross-phase modulation as well. Four-wave mixing is a bit more intricate because in this case, we can launch in a number of distinct frequencies into a nonlinear medium. 
and then the spectrum at the output will contain even more distinct frequencies as power gets transferred from the initial ones into these other ones thanks to the nonlinearity. It's very important to keep in mind that four-way mixing will only be a significant effect if the phase matching condition right here is satisfied. Essentially, we have to require that the spatial frequencies of the uh, incident frequencies, as well as the spatial frequencies of the products over here, uh, match up in just a certain way for power to be coherently transferred from these ones into the, the new ones. And for the case where these frequencies are fairly closely spaced, um, essentially the condition boils down to demanding that the square of the spacing multiplied onto the beta 2 parameter plus the phase shift from the nonlinearity all add up to zero. And if we think about this a bit, we can see that this should only really be possible if beta 2 is negative, because the square of the spacing will always be positive, and so will the power, and gamma is usually, pretty much almost always, positive. So the only real option here is that beta 2 is negative. In other words, if we have a positive value of beta 2, it should be impossible for four-way mixing to really kick in. Next we have the Raman effect, and just briefly, it involves a shift in the spectrum towards the red end, that is to say the lower frequency, and also some uh, broadening generally. With regards to self-steepening, I think I neglected to mention this in my original video on this effect, but essentially we expect it to cause blue-skewed broadening. And the reason can be understood if we remember the formula for the chirp of a pulse in the presence of a nonlinearity. Basically, the instantaneous frequency of a pulse is going to be proportional to the negative time derivative of the power. And um, if you look at the first part of the pulse right here, the leading part, we can see that it has a fairly uh, shallow uh, increasing slope, so we expect that to cause a small red chirp. But the back part of the self steepened pulse should um, experience quite a large blue chirp because the slope here is very negative. So that overall explains this blue skewed broadening we see right here. Okay, so here's just a quick summary of all the different nonlinear effects that might be present. Um, so let's take a look at the actual simulations and see if we can determine which of these effects play a role at what stage of the pulse evolution. So the technique here is going to be to uh, first simulate the entire evolution with all the different effects being present, and then we're going to turn off individual mechanisms one by one to truly see what impact they have. So in this case, everything is on, but now we're going to switch the Raman effect off. So now it's off and now it's on, now it's off and on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off. So what can we say about this? Well, we can notice that whether the Raman effect is on or off, the pulse undergoes soliton fission right here at around one meter. So for the first meter propagation, the pulse basically behaves like a soliton because it sort of squeezes in to a big spike. But as soon as we hit this location here, the peak of the soliton sort of splits off into its own little branch here that uh, walks off the further we propagate forward. Now again, this happens both when Raman is on and off, but what we can notice is that when Raman is on, it seems to have sort of a parabolic trajectory further and further to the right, whereas when it's off, it just walks off linearly. So essentially what we're seeing here for the case when Raman being on is a Raman soliton, that is to say a pulse that's so intense that the Raman effect can essentially uh, continuously redshift the color of the pulse as it moves forward. So this pulse becomes more and more red, and since beta 2 is negative, red light moves uh, more slowly than blue light. That explains why it keeps trailing further and further and further behind the more we move forward. But when the Raman effect is off, the split off uh, soliton here just maintains its color and doesn't really change, so it simply walks off at a constant rate. We can also see in the spectral domain that when the Raman effect is off, we have this branch over here that's quite intense, which moves further and further and further towards lower frequencies and longer wavelengths, but that's completely absent when we turn the Raman effect off. Next, we can take a look at self-steepening. So once again, here is the result when everything is turned on, and now I'm going to switch self-steepening off. So now it's on and off and on and off and on and off. And I think the main thing we can notice right here is that the spectrum and the pulse evolution doesn't really change very much whether or not we have self-steepening on. In fact, it seems like the main effect on the spectral domain is that the spectrum becomes a little bit broader when we deactivate self-steepening. And if you think back to the previous slide I showed you, that should make sense because we expect self-steepening to cause a blue biased uh, broadening. So without that, the pulse is allowed to uh, grow more into the, the red region right here. That should also explain why we see the Raman soliton here um, slowing down, or rather uh, drifting away much more quickly when self-steepening is off because without that additional blue shift from self-steepening, 
the pulse gets more red, all things being equal, and therefore it drifts off more quickly. So anyway, it's kind of interesting that self-deepening plays a role in the evolution of the spectrum, but all things considered a fairly, fairly minor one. And just for good measure, let's see what happens if we turn both the Raman effect and self-deepening off simultaneously. So once again, everything is on right now, but now I switch both of them off. So on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off. Now, once again, what's interesting here is that the Raman effect and self-steepening are, at least mathematically, the most complicated nonlinear effects included in the generalized nonlinear Schrödinger equation, but they don't seem to play the major part in actually generating this very large range of frequencies, because this very large range appears whether or not they're on or deactivated, as you can see here. So it must be some of the other nonlinear effects that give rise to this very broad spectrum. One thing we can note is that the zero dispersion frequency is located right here at the dashed line, so everything that's over here will experience negative dispersion, and everything over here will experience positive dispersion. So now let's take a look at what happens if I keep everything the same, including both Raman and self-steepening, but just flip the sign of the beta 2 parameter, meaning we go from having a normalized dispersion to normal dispersion. And here we see the result. So right now beta 2 is positive, and I don't think I need to flip back and forth in order to show you that something's definitely changed from uh, beta 2 being negative to beta 2 being positive. We can see that in this case, the pulse evolution is much more smooth and much more predictable, apart from maybe a little bit of optical wave breaking taking place right here. And for the spectrum, it still broadens a bit, but it sort of uh, doesn't get as broad as we, we saw before. So it's very interesting that um, this broadening behavior completely disappears as soon as we flip the sign. And I think it indicates that four-way mixing is um, plays a big role in generating this very wide range of, um, of frequencies right here, um, because it's very phase sensitive, obviously, so the um, behavior completely disappears when we flip the sign. You could also say that with beta 2 being positive, we don't get a solitonic behavior, so the pulse never really shrinks into a big spike that can cause the, the major broadening. That's probably also a uh, contributing factor to this being much more narrow when beta 2 is positive. Finally, we can take a look at a zoomed-in version of this evolution just for the first one and a half meters. So if we zoom in, we can see that indeed we get this solitonic behavior for the first one meter propagation, and then we have the soliton fission happening right here. Now, I want to stress that soliton fission can actually uh, happen for a number of reasons. It could be uh, both the presence of uh, beta-3 or the Raman effect or self-steepening. It basically has to be um, just the conditions necessary for solitons and then some other effect that can disturb that evolution. And I think actually in this case it's probably the presence of beta 3 that's mainly responsible for the, the splitting. But in any case, in the spectral domain, we can see that the pulse is initially dominated by self-phase modulation because it starts out with a very strong central frequency lobe here that then diverges into two different bumps that broaden quite quickly. And so here we can begin to see the effect of the uh, Raman soliton sort of growing off to the lower frequencies here. And maybe a bit of forward mixing taking place over here generating new components at uh, 320 terahertz. So just to recap, we saw that in the first meter propagation, the pulse behaves like a soliton and the spectrum is dominated by self-phase modulation. Then for the next half a meter, uh, soliton fission begins to kick in and we get new frequency components over here at 320. And then for the rest of the evolution, the spectrum and the pulse are dominated by the Raman effect because this Raman soliton begins to drift off towards um, greater and greater time delays and we get a general redshift in the spectrum thanks to the, the Raman effect with a small contribution from self-steepening. So I hope you found this video on analyzing supercontinuum generation in optical fibers interesting. Feel free to check out some of my other videos over here and see the description for a link to the code used to these simulations. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.